Jesus said, go into all the world and make disciples, followers of Christ's pattern. Somebody say amen. amen. Which means principally walking in his footprints. Man, last week's message in whose footprints are you following? Whose footsteps are you following, man? I was thinking about that all week when I was making decisions. Like whose footprints am I going to follow in regards to making a decision in this moment, in this time, in this space of whatever it is that I'm going through? And, and, and this week is kind of an in-between. It's kind of what I call a gap week message. It's in between the end of a series and the beginning of a series. And, and, and what I'm going to minister to you on today day, I believe, can absolutely change your world. Anybody ready for your world to be changed? Come on, anybody ready for your world to be changed? It goes along with the story in Mark chapter 9, and it's one of my favorite stories of a father that had nowhere else to go for relief. Can somebody in this place relate? Or you've got nowhere else to go for relief. Nowhere else to lean on, no direction to go, but only to Jesus. And it says this in this, if you, if you open up your Bibles, you have your Bibles, go to, go to, go to Mark 9, verse 14, and it says this, and, and I don't think I gave it to you guys, but it says this, and when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him and greeted him. This is Jesus. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? When one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son who has a mute spirit. It says, and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered him and said, oh, faithless generation. Man, can you imagine Je you following Jesus? You following his footsteps? You're his disciple. And he looked back at you and said, oh, faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. <laughs> Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed. As soon as the spirit saw Jesus, it went into action. It says that as soon as they brought him and he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. This spirit was so strong that it would try to destroy the kid's life. Are you hearing it? So it says, throw him into the fire and throw him into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, this is the part like, that some of us get caught up in. If you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. I believe, but help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. And the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly, and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. And when he had come into the house, his disciples asked him privately, catch this part, why could we not cast it out? So he said to them, this kind can come out by nothing but prayer and fasting. Can you relate? Can you relate to going through something that has kept you captive, kept you locked in, kept you unable to get out? 
Can you relate to going through something and not having any form of relief, but only going through the cycle, the repetitive cycle, the repetitive nature of this thing over and over and over again? Jesus asked and said, how long has this been happening? And he said, since childhood. And I want to say something. There's some people that are walking through life and there's some things that have been a part of your life since childhood that only Jesus can set you free from. It's been holding on to you and you've been holding on to it. But today is a day that we speak to that deaf and dumb spirit and we command it to come out. He says, and Jesus said to him, if you can, he says, if you can help me. And Jesus said in the ESV, it says, if you can, explanation point, all things are possible for one who believes. Now, 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 the word possible is the Greek word dunata, and it expresses the idea of ability, power, one who is able and capable, or one who is competent. The word dunata shares the same root with the word dunamis, which is Greek for the, the Greek word for power. And this tells us that there is power that causes one to become able, capable, and competent for any tasks. There's some people in this place that today, by the end of this message, it is my prayer that you become able and capable and be enabled to know that all things are possible through Christ Jesus. The day Jesus taught this principle, if one can simply believe anything is possible, even setting a possessed person free from demon spirits, wherever faith is present, grab this, wherever, wherever faith is present, the impossible is doable. The impossible is dual, doable. Expl ex understand the, 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 the situation that this father's going through. Maybe you're in this place and you can relate a little bit better as it not being something that you're personally going through, but something your child is going through. And you see your child constantly being thrown into terror, constantly being thrown into the fire, constantly being thrown into the water because the enemy has a plan to destroy their life. And you're sitting there and you're just looking and you're like, I see the pain. I see the brokenness. I want to see my child set free. He says he went to the disciples. And he, he, he asked them for help, and they couldn't do it. You went to somebody who you thought could be able to speak into your life, and they weren't able to do it. And Jesus said, when the disciples said, why weren't we able to do this? He says, some things only happen by prayer and fasting. See, see, some of us, we got the prayer part right. But how are we when it comes to crucifying the flesh? How are we when it comes to setting the flesh aside, breaking the flesh so that we can get to our breakthrough? Even Jesus fasted. But instead, we'd rather indulge on the worldliness, indulge on the food, indulge on the things that keep us bound. Listen, by setting the plate away and going to the Lord in prayer, there can be a breakthrough that can only happen through prayer and fasting. Somebody say amen. amen. Listen, it's up to you and me to get our thinking in line with God's word. It's not up to God's word to get to get in line with our thinking. It's up to you and me to get our thinking in line with God's word. Jesus made it very clear that we receive exactly what we believe. He says, if I believe I can do the if, I, if, if he says, if you believe all things are possible. What does that say? If I believe, then I will be able to do it. If I believe that I can do the impossible, I will be able to do it. But if I believe I cannot do the impossible, I will not do it. The God you see is the God you get, I heard it said like that. And many of us, we're locked up. We're in these prisons. We're in our own prisons because we don't believe that God can set us free. When I look at those in life, who's ever told me that I couldn't do something. When you look at people in life who's ever told you that you couldn't do something, most of them are ones who ain't ever did nothing themselves. Are you hearing me? How you go tell me what I can and can't do and you ain't did nothing at all. 
Don't speak to me because you don't have the courage to walk on water. Don't speak to me because you don't have courage to step out of the boat. Don't speak to me because you don't have faith that Jesus will get you to the other side. But as for me and my house, I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. I get a little excited. When I think about the word of God, the power of God, I can't just I can't just minister just standing here. I got to move. Why? Because there's dunamis inside of me. It wasn't until the father and Mark met Jesus he, that, 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 that things changed. He had he had probably been surrounded with a group of people who gave him no hope and demonstrated no faith. He says, I believe. And I, I just we, we got it. We, we're doing a glimpse. We're looking in. We're allowed to peer into the story. Right. He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. And there's two different ways we could take that. Could he be saying that I believe, but help my unbelief? Those that are around me, that their faith. Faith is not as strong as mine, but I need to be able to partner because we're two or three touch and agree. It shall be established. I believe, but help my unbelief. Help those that are surrounding me. Could that be our case? I believe, but those around me don't. Then maybe you need to reposition yourself. Right? I believe, but help my unbelief. Or could it be sometimes like the majority of the time when we go through things, right? We believe, but there's an internal battle inside of us, too, that says, can it really happen for me? He says, I believe, but help my unbelief. He needed, he needed his son to be set free. And it wasn't until the father got around Jesus and heard Jesus speaking words of faith that he believed. And as soon as the father believed, it was just a matter. It wasn't, it wasn't another, another week. It wasn't another month. It was within a matter of minutes that his son got set free. Immediately when you believe, you can get out of your jail. I posted something this past week that, that has to do with the title of today's message. Today's message title is Breaking Free from Your Prison. And I posted something. If you can put that Facebook post up there, I posted something on Facebook and I said, living in a mental prison of fear and anxiety is not God's plan for your life. As a child of God, you can find peace no matter what storm is raging all around you. Psalms 52, 22 says, cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Cast thy burden upon the Lord and he shall sustain thee. Cast your burden Upon the Lord and he will sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. I don't know what storm you're in. I don't know. I don't know what you're going through, but you do. And there, and there may be a, a convulsing spirit inside that knows too. And what I want you to do with the sheet of paper that I gave you is I want you to write down what imprisons you. I want you to write down what imprisons you. What emotion it may be, what it is that you worry about, what it is that you stress about. All of us have a prison. So I want every single one of us at this point to write down what imprisons you. Maybe it's unbelief. Maybe, maybe it's, it, it's not trusting the word of God. I don't know what your prison sentence is, but you do. And I want you to get set free today. Write it down real quick. And as you write that down. I want to explain something to you. You don't have to write a whole paragraph, a whole book. You just, just write, you can write one word phrase is God knows. He's, he's smart. He's intelligent. The word cast, listen to me. The word cast means throw forcefully in a specified direction. So when, when you read that psalm, it, it gives a specific direction. That word cast means throw forcefully in a specified direction. When we follow the footprints of the word of God, we are to cast your burden, your heavy load, your cause of hardship, your worry, and your grief. Listen to me. We are to cast those things onto the Lord. The word of God is our pattern. Jesus was and is our pattern man. Once you have, have it written, just kind of wave at me. I want to see that everybody got it. Everybody got something written. Amen. 
Now I want you to ball it up. The Holy Spirit is our power. In Psalm 52, 22, in the Passion Translation, it says it like this. It says, so here's what I've learned through it all. Leave all your cares and anxieties at the feet of the Lord, and measureless grace will strengthen you. I want us to take a second to step out of our comfort zone. And I want you to take a second, and I want you to bring up your balled up prison sentence, and I want you to cast it at this altar as a representation of casting it at the feet of Jesus. So stand up, walk up here, and cast your prison sentence at the feet of Jesus. Don't just throw, throw that thing. Like, I'm, I'm getting rid of you. I'm letting you go. You will no longer bound me. You will, never, you will never lock me in chains again. I'm throwing this sentence at the altar of the Lord. I'm throwing this sentence at the feet of Jesus. See, some of y'all are doing it nonchalant, but some of y'all are feeling this in the spiritual realm. You're feeling yourself right now getting set free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. His grace is beyond measure, beyond limit to strengthen those that cast their burdens on the Lord. We cast our burdens on the Lord. Come on. There's a quote that says this by Jerry Bridges. You keep coming. Keep, keep casting them. And you that are watching online, write something and throw it at your screen. Make sure it's on paper, though. Don't throw a tablet or a phone, amen. Paper, amen. And throw it at the screen. Jerry Bridges says this, Christian author and speaker, he says, your worst days are never so bad that you are beyond the reach of God's grace. And your best days are never so good that you are beyond the needs of God's grace. Let me give you a few points. First point is recognize God's plan for your life. It says in Jeremiah 29, verse 11, it says, for I know the plans. I wear it on one of my bracelets right here. It says, for, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. What does that mean? When I feel like I'm locked up and I can't progress, I can't go forward, God has a plan. And if he knows the plans for my future, Come on, if he knows the plans for my future, then I can't stay locked up. I can't stay in prison. The message says it like this. I know what I'm doing. I have it all planned out. Plans to take care of you, not abandon you. Plans to give you the future you hope for. God, I believe, but help my unbelief. See, you got to keep yourself around Spirit-thinking individuals, people who think along the wavelength of Jesus and not the wavelength of this world. Because when you're around those that think along the wavelength of this world, you will stay locked up. You will stay in prison. You will stay ones that are in bondage and not free. Do y'all mind if I preach this thing? You remember the story, Joseph? Joseph's journey from the prison to the palace in Genesis 37 through 50. If you don't, go back and read it. Get it in you. He, despite facing betrayal, false accusations, and imprisonment, Joseph remained faithful to God's plan for his life. And God used Joseph's experience to prepare him for a position of influence and blessing. Your experience is preparing you. He didn't stay in the prison of betrayal. He didn't stay in the prison of false accusation. He didn't stay in the, in the physical prison. God knew what he was doing. Can we trust that God knows what he is doing? We just have to recognize that he has a plan. God will either lighten the load or strengthen our backs. Maybe we got to walk with a thorn in our flesh. God will either lighten the load or he'll strengthen our backs. Quit proclaiming how broken you are. Quit proclaiming how tired you are. And proclaim that I am filled with the joy and the power of God because you get what you speak. Break the pattern of imprisonment. God will either lighten the load or strengthen our backs. But we must stay on the path of casting our burdens 
on him. Next thing I want to tell you is this. Embrace peace in life storms. Man, storm, storm. And you know, my, 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 my 11-year-old, sometimes she still gets scared of storms. It gets the thunder and poof. Dad, dad, is it a tornado coming? Because, you know, what gets imprinted in our minds is tornadoes tear stuff up. And as a kid, all you have to have seen is one image of a tornado. And when storms come, you, you, you can begin to think the worst. So I usually open up my app, and now I've got the color grids down now, right? If, it, if it's yellow, it's white, it's usually good. But if there's red, sweetheart, we're just going to believe God for protection, right? We have to live our lives like that, y'all. Storms come. But it don't always mean it's going to take your house down. It don't always mean that you're going to have some, some collateral damage. Storms pass by, too. They don't, you, if you ever notice, a storm don't just stay in one place. It gets the moving. So it only lasts for a little while. But if you chase the storm, and sometimes we chase the storms with our mouths, and we chase the storm, speak in the storm, speak in the storm, we wonder why we're still under the cloud of the storm. The storm was supposed to be moved, but the Bible says that there is life and death in the tongue. There is power of life and death in the tongue. Keep speaking it. That's your prison. Bible says in Philippians 4, 6 through 7, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I love how the Passion Translation says it. Can y'all put this up in the Passion for me real quick? I love the Passion. It says, it says, don't be pulled in different directions or worried about a thing. Be saturated in prayer throughout each day, offering your faith-filled request. Faith-filled, not fear-filled, not doubt-filled, but faith-filled request before God with overflowing gratitude. God, I thank you, Lord, that you hear me. Lord, I thank you, Lord, that that storm they say may be coming, but it's passing over my house. It's, it's passing over my house. Not even a hail drop shall touch my roof. Lord, I thank you, Lord, with this faith-filled request with gratitude. Tell him every detail of your life. See, some of us, we think God, don't, he don't want to know. He don't want to hear from you. He already know. But it's your faith-filled request that brings forth transformation. Lord, I need you to help me in this storm. I tell, we tell people all the time, we will only come into your life situation the way you invite us in. We're not going to butt ourselves into your marriage. We're not going to butt ourselves into your home. We're not going to butt ourselves into your financial aspects, none of that. But if you invite us in, we can help you in areas. But I'm not just going to, you need to be doing it. No, I'm not Lord. God will only, that's a pattern of God. God will only come into what you invite him into. When they went in the fiery furnace, they said, we'll go. We trust that our God shall deliver us. But even if he don't, he got invited into the furnace. They didn't just say, well, here I go. Here's my life situation. I guess this is what it is. Let's burn up. Tell him every detail of your life. Next slide. Then God's wonderful peace that transcends human understanding will make the answers known to you through Jesus Christ. The answers are coming. They don't even make sense. I can't tell y'all how many things have happened in my life that didn't make near sense. But all I know is I invited Jesus. I invited Jesus to the party. Because what we know is Jesus calms the storm. 
Mark chapter 4, verse 35 through 41, Jesus, Jesus had just told the parable of the mustard seed. He said, mustard seed sown, in small, uh, sown is small, but it grows up and becomes a great, a great tree. A tree where the birds of the air can nest under its shade, the scripture says. Then he said to the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. See, he said to the disciples, let us cross over to the other side. I've preached this before, and I said as long as Jesus is in the boat, that he'll get us to the other side. The problems that we run into is many of us, we forget that Jesus is in the boat. Because as the storm came, the disciples were like, Lord, do you care for us? They forgot who was in the boat. They forgot that he said, we're going to the other side. Jesus was asleep. The storm didn't bother him. He not. I believe the Lord's too holy to snore. So let's just say he was just. They said, Lord, do you care that we're perishing? The storm came, the waves beat the boat, but Jesus was asleep. The disciples got anxious, they got perplexed, they got worried, but Jesus was in the boat. He rose up and he rebuked the wind and see and said, be still. The God who knows the plans for your life to get you to the other side is about to be still some storms and some winds that may be your prison sentence. When Jesus spoke, he spoke to the spirit. He said, you deaf and dumb spirit, get out. When Jesus got up, he he rebuked the wind. He said, when? He rebuked him. He said, be still. You got to speak your circumstance and your storm by name and proclaim it to be defeated. That's why I had you cast. That's why I had you cast these these cares at the feet of Jesus. We got to cast our burdens upon the Lord. Jesus demonstrated his power over the storms of life, both literal and metaphorically. Just as Jesus calmed the storm for his disciples, he offers us his peace through our life's trials and storms. Cast our burdens upon the Lord. First Peter 5, 7 says, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. You're not called to carry the load by yourself. Think of Elijah's victory on Mount Carmel, 1 Kings chapter 18. You can go and read the story. Elijah faced immense pressure and fear as he confronted the prophets of Baal. Despite the odds, there were over 400 prophets of Baal. Despite the odds, Elijah, one person, cast his burdens upon the Lord and witnessed God's miraculous intervention. He said, oh, you guys worship Baal? Call on, here's what we'll do. Call up on your gods and call for a fire. And they cried out, they pled, they they, they, they said, we speak fire, we speak blah, blah, blah. I'm just paraphrasing, right? They called for fire, and and, and Elijah said, "Um, um, is is your God on break? Like, because we're waiting. You guys are so powerful. We're waiting. He says, your God got another assignment going on? Then it says, Elijah, listen to what happened. Elijah, there was a trench. He filled the trench with water. He poured water up on the altar. You do not pour water on what you're, you're calling fire for. You use water to put fires out. He poured water up on the up on up on the up on the area, the altar, and he began to pray that his God, the one and only God, would bring down fire from heaven. And fire came down, consumed the water. And I could just imagine Elijah saying, "Now that's my God. You still waiting on yours?" He had to step out on faith. The challenge. Of of, of whose God will show their power by bringing fire on the sacrificed bull. Can you trust and believe that your God can bring the fire? Where you're passionless, where you're without fire, God can bring the fire. Where you need a move, where you feel locked up, God can bring the fire. 
We have to dwell in his presence. We have to dwell in the presence of the Lord. Psalm 1611 says, you make known to me the path of life in your presence. There is fullness of joy at your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The message says it like this. Now you've got my feet on the life path. Follow his footsteps. All radiant from the shining of your face. Ever since you took my hand, I'm on the right way. Ever since you took my hand, Lord, you've just guided me like a child, and I'm just following in your footsteps. See, the problem is some of us, we let go of his hand and say, I got this. And then we wonder why we walk ourselves in a prison. It's because we let go of his hand. Think about your child, your, young, your, your, your youngest kid, or when they were younger. Mom and dad carried, I'm going to hold your hand because I didn't want you to run across the street. Because if I let, you, if I let go of your hand, you're just, you, you just running all willy-nilly. You just, you just don't even think about nothing, just running, right? And I don't want to see you crash. Our God is the same way. He says, if you care about your children, you're earthly. Like, let me, let me hold your hand so that you don't run out to the wrong street. So you don't run to the wrong sources. So you don't be bound by something that I've called for you to be unbound by. Ever since he took my hand, I've been on the right way. His presence brings fullness of joy. Remember the story, Mary and Martha in Luke chapter 10. The story says this, says in Jesus As Jesus and the disciples continued on their journey, they came to a village where a woman welcomed Jesus into her home. Her name was Martha, and she had a sister named Mary. Mary sat down attentively before the master, absorbing every revelation he shared. But Martha became exasperated by finishing the numerous household chores in preparation for her guests. So she interrupted Jesus and said, Lord, don't you think it's unfair? You ever ever thought that? You ever? Don't you think it's unfair? That my sister left me to do all the work by myself? You should tell her to get up and help me. The Lord answered her, Martha, my beloved Martha, why are you upset and troubled? Pulled away by all these many distractions. Are they really that important? See, we, we major on, on the minor. We, we major as people. We major on the minor things. He says, are they they really that important? Mary has discovered the one thing most important by choosing to sit at my feet. She is undistracted. And I won't take this privilege from her. See, Mary, Mary chose to sit at the feet of Jesus, soaking in his presence. While Martha was distracted by many things, Jesus commanded Mary, commended Mary for choosing the better portion, emphasizing the importance of prioritizing time in his presence. Man, we can get so busy doing everything except things for him. One of my friends that posted on, on social media, I don't have the sh- all the statistics, but it was like what happens in 365 days. Like we spend X amount of days working w- based on hours. We spend X amount of days, um, you know, vacationing. It was like two, two, I think it was like 14 days. They say vacation, including weekend stuff. Um, that would be nice, right? I know I don't get 14 days vacation, Lord. Oh, man. But he, and then he talked about, like, what we spend, you know, family time and all this stuff. And then when it came that time to, like, the time of God, it, it, like, allocated to, like, seven days on average. Horrible. That includes Bible reading time. That includes worship time. That includes church time. Like, out of 365 days, the hours of 365 days, we give God seven or less but we say, I'm in this prison, and I don't know why I'm here. Could it be because we're much like the busy sister, just busy and distracted by all those other things that occupy our schedule and our time? 
even as 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 as, as business owners, as, as as employees of corporations and companies, man, it's okay to clock out. Because I can tell you this, every organization will replace you faster than you can replace them. And when you give them your time over giving your family that time, your family is going to miss that. That company's they're, they're getting theirs. And there's sometimes we no. <laughs> can you work overtime? I could, but I don't want to. Somebody needs to grab that. Many, 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 many live in prisons of worry. Many live in prisons of busyness. Many live in prisons of pain. Many live in prisons of anxiety. And many just live in prisons of distractions like Martha. It's time for us to break free from your prison that holds you from the peace that awaits us all in his presence. Being like Mary and discovering that peace that can only come through us being at the feet. Trusting that God has a plan. I don't have to worry about everything. There's, listen, y'all, there's plenty of things that are out of my control. There's plenty of things that are out of your control. I don't have to worry about those things. I choose to worry about those things. You choose to worry about those. I don't have to worry about those things. He speaks and says that the, the, the grass, the li- they don't worry about nothing. The birds don't worry about nothing. Why you worry? I got you. We choose to worry about those things because we forget that God has a plan. Doctor reports, I don't worry. You know, it is what it is, doc. Job doing something different. You know what it is? It is what it is. Because you're not my source. You're a resource. This body shall pass away. But I'm, I'm going somewhere. <laughs> Come on, I'm going somewhere, doc. It's like that. that our, our, the Bible says our life is like a vapor. We're here one second and gone the next. I don't know what my vapor is. I pray my vapor is longer than 45, but I mean, listen, I don't know what my vapor is. Our life here on earth is just like this. It's short. Enjoy it. Why are you stressing and worried in this gap that you got? You take days off of your life when you worry. This is our life. But eternity, it don't end. We get to eternity, you ain't got no car note. You ain't got no house payment. You ain't got to buy groceries. You ain't got to pay kids lunches. You ain't got to buy gas. It's all paid for through our worship. Oh. He paid the price. So why are we in prisons? I want us to walk away today holding on to these things. Recognize God's plan. Embrace peace in the storms. Cast our burdens upon the Lord. Dwell in the presence of the Lord. Charles Spurgeon says this. Conversion is a turning into the right road. The next thing is to walk in it. The daily going on in that road is essential as the first starting if you would reach the desired end. To strike the first blow is not all the battle. To him that overcomes, the crown is promised. To start in the race is nothing. Many have done that who have failed. But to hold out till you reach the winning post is the great point of the matter. Perseverance is, a, is n- as necessary to a man's salvation as conversion. Perseverance is as necessary to a man's salvation as conversion. Starting a race don't mean nothing. Because some of us are like some old cars we used to have. They start, they stop, they start, they stop. You don't know what is going to happen, right? 
Come on, you ever you ever have to have to jump or, or pump push start a, a stick? Come on, a stick or a motorcycle, you got to get that thing going. Pop it. That's how you got to do it. Some of us are like that. We just we don't know if we're going to start. We don't know if we're going to stop. But I want to tell you, God wants to set you free. The grace of God, the Father, and the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ through the fellowship of the Holy Spirit dwells with us forever. Living in fear and anxiety is not God's plan for your life. By recognizing his plan, embracing his peace, casting your burdens upon him and dwelling in his presence, you can break free from your prison of fear and anxiety and experience the abundant life he has promised you. I want to ask you a few questions real quick, and then we're going to do our altar call. Have you ever been attempted, have you ever attempted to do something that others said was impossible? And how did their words affect you? If others say something's impossible and their words affect you, you're in a prison. You're in a prison of someone else's mindset. Did they encourage you to, to, to believe or did they drag you down into unbelief and defeat? Said, I believe, but help my unbelief. Second question, who is speaking into your life right now? When you look at the friends who speak into your life, are they people who have challenged the impossible and done it? Or are they people who have done nothing and are telling you that you are going to do nothing too? You ain't nothing. You ain't going to be nothing. Your granddaddy wasn't nothing. Your daddy wasn't nothing. Nothing runs in your family. Oh, really? But I serve the God of the impossible. He makes the impossible doable. Here's a question really to ponder. If the impossible happens where faith is activated, what is likely going to happen in your life if things continue the way they're going right now? If the impossible happens where faith is activated, what is likely going to happen in your life if things continue the way they are right now? Is there faith in you activated to change anything? Father, we know that you are the Lord of the impossible because all things are possible to those who believe. And Father, I don't know what position, I don't know what posture of hearts or minds have entered into your sanctuary today. Father, we've casted our burdens at the feet. We've casted our burdens at the altar. And there may be some people in this place that say, Lord, I believe but help my unbelief because this is something that's been going on through childhood. And Father, I pray in the mighty name of Jesus for that prison sentence that has been written on every single paper, God, by name. We bind them in the mighty name of Jesus and we speak who the sun sets free is free indeed, God. We ask for dunamis power, Father. We ask for power to be enabled inside of us, God, to help us make it through every storm because Jesus is in the boat, God, to help us to make it through every situation and circumstance because Jesus is in the boat, God. And you know the plans that you have for our lives, God. So help us to understand and to lean into your plans. Your answers that are unexplainable, beyond man's reason, but capable and able and doable. We pray those things over our lives in Jesus' name. Just close your eyes in this place. You online, close your eyes. I don't want you thinking about nothing but Jesus right now. 
freedom in Jesus. I, 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 I want, here's what I want you to I want you to close your eyes, and I want, to, I want you to see yourself in the prison cell. I want you to see yourself sitting in the prison cell. Looking around, there ain't nobody else there that you can see. But now I want you to see yourself standing to your feet. And I want you to see yourself walking up to that gate, walking up to that, to that, 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 that jail cell, the door. And I just want you to see yourself just pushing it and it opening up. And as it opens up, you realize that you've been able to get free all along. But because you sat there, did nothing, believed nothing, nothing happened. But since you stood up, walked forward, and pushed that door open, it opened wide open for you to walk out of and to be free from that cage forevermore. Jesus came so that you could be free from the cages of life forevermore. You don't have to stay there. Every person right now that just walked out of a jail cell, walk up to this altar. 